Today's video is about managing LLM costs. I spent a lot of time this week managing my own LLM costs, and I even built a tool using Tinybird to help me better analyze where I'm spending money. This tool is completely open source and free, and I'm going to talk about it in the last half of the video. The app I'm working on myself right now is an open source app called Inbox Zero, and a lot of the examples in this video are going to be based on that. In Inbox Zero's case, it's an AI assistant to help you manage your email. So the video will talk about a lot of the challenges I face there, but the same challenges apply to really every AI SaaS. So let's dive into things. Here I have an LLM API pricing calculator to give a good idea of the different costs of different APIs. So here you can see that GPT-4 in the example I've set up is going to cost me $88 per month, whereas GPT-3.5 Turbo is going to be only $3 per month. You can decide to put tokens or words or characters. I've gone with words because it's the easiest, but if you want to convert tokens to words, a thousand tokens is around 750 words typically. So here in the case of Inbox Zero, I'm processing lots of emails for users every month. So a typical user will get around 2000 emails per month and each email is around a thousand words. And let's say I'm just trying to classify what the email is. So the output will actually be small. Then you'll see that the costs basically turn out to be $88 for GPT-4, which is extremely expensive. One other tool I like to use to see different outputs of LLMs and pricing is the Vercel tool. It's Playground. So for example, GPT-3.5 Turbo is is $2 per million tokens. The GPT-4 is $60 per million tokens. So this is a nice tool. You can also see how well does each LLM perform because that's something very important to be aware of. If I ask a question here, like classify this email and all of them give the same result, then I should probably go with Mistral. But if I see GPT-4 is actually giving much better results, so then I start have to start thinking, okay, how can I manage costs so I can get the highest quality amount of money spent? So there are a few different ways to mitigate costs. We've covered some ideas already. One, it's very much tied to how much you can charge your users. So if you're charging your users $500 a month for the service, then $100 might be okay. But for many of us who have SaaSes with, let's say, $50 plans or $10 plans, now we've got to think about it a lot more. You can obviously use a cheaper LLM, as we suggested, but then the quality might not be as good. You can decide to use a cheaper LLM depending on the task at hand. And this is also a concept called LLM routers. So certain tasks might be sent to GPT 3.5, whereas others are sent to GPT 4. Or certain actions, you might decide to decide what the action is with a cheaper LLM, but when you actually go to execute it, you want to be not 90% sure, you want to be 95% sure that it's the right action to execute. So then you'll pass it to the GPT-4, but that's only in very specific cases. So there's all sorts of ways to do this. There are lots of tools coming out to help with this. So that's another idea to play around with. You can also fine tune LLM. So you could fine tune GPT-3.5, maybe even based on GPT-4 data, and then you can improve it a lot and maybe get the same results for a much cheaper LLM. I'm not sure you're actually allowed to use GPT-4 to tune other LLMs, but that's something you'd have to look into yourself. Another option is just send less data. For example, if I'm sending emails to the LLM to process and manage, don't send every single word of the email and all the footer and every small piece of data, just send the snippet or who it's from or the subject line. You could send a lot less data and still get quite similar results. And maybe the LLM asks if it needs some extra data to perform the action. If it's deciding it has to reply to this email, now maybe it wants a full context and so now you can send it. So on a similar line, you can actually summarize data for the LLM. You could pass it to a cheap GPT first, summarize it, and then pass it into a more powerful GPT to actually complete the work. In this way, you could heavily reduce the input costs. And there are also tools that do this that will remove a lot of tokens. Microsoft actually has a tool that helps with this. It's called LLM Lingua. It basically can compress the token. So a lot of the tokens you send in the input aren't actually important for the LLM to create a good output. And they say they can even get up to 20x compression using this method. So the idea is you'd basically compress the text with cheaper tools or cheaper LLMs, and then you'd pass that input into the next LLM that's more expensive, but now the costs are way down because you're sending it way less data. Another idea you can use is not to use an LLM for things you don't need an LLM for. So for example, let's say I was trying to find an unsubscribe link in a long uh, email document full of HTML. I could send it to an LLM and it could probably go and find it quite well, but I could also just write some code to look for a link in the text that has unsubscribe or remove me from the email list or something like that. There's probably only five, 10 different options for finding that unsubscribe link in the email. So I don't actually need an LLM to do this. And now I've saved a lot of work instead of sending thousands of emails to the LLM to go and be processed to find the unsubscribe link. I found another way to do it without an LLM. And this is also a technique that I've been using. Something else that is important to do is track your spending per action and per user, especially once you start to have AI actions in lots of different places in the app and lots of different users. You might not need this starting out, but as you get more serious, you do want to keep control of it and see like what you actually spending it on because it's nice to do it on 
on a high uh, theoretical level, but like the actual cost is what matters. If you go to the OpenAI usage dashboard, you'll see how much you're spending at a very high level, but you're not going to see it per user per action. So in this video, I'm actually going to show you how I built a mini tool using TinyBird. There are a few tools that do this for you if you don't want to build it yourself, but also I built this tool so you can reuse the code that I've written. There are tools out there that you can use. For example, this is one called Trace Loop, but you can see it. They say, yes, you can afford it, but no, it's not actually so affordable. I can get 10,000 LLM calls per month for free, but if I want to do 50,000 calls, which is definitely going to be the case in my email example, just 25 users is going to get me to 50,000 calls. It already cost me $500 per month. There are other tools like Springtime, Agent Smith that you can take a look at. Another idea is to self-host the LLM. And the last one is actually a cool concept that I want to play with at some point. It's user-hosted LLMs in the browser. So this downloads the model, for example, Mistral, it downloads a few gigabytes of data into your browser, and then it will use the user's browser to actually perform the tasks. So it, this is a project on GitHub. It's open source. Everything runs in the browser, no server-side support. And you can see it actually does quite a good job. I think what we'll also start to see here is browser extension-based LLM. So instead of having to download a few gigabytes of data for each website you go to, there will be a Chrome extension that has already downloaded it and you can connect to that. Also, people will just be running the LLMs on their computer anyway, and you'll be able to connect to those. There are a few different ways to do this, but obviously most of your users won't necessarily have these tools installed. What's nice about Web LLM is that you can actually go and download it for them in the browser. It will store a few gigabytes of data in their browser. Hopefully they have space for that. And then you'd be able to run the LLM from within the browser itself and not have to send anything to server. And that's also great for privacy. I hope that gives you a few different ideas of what you can do. And on, I mentioned that I built a tool using TinyBit. So I'm going to show you what that looks like. All the data, every AI call that I make, I'm sending the data to TinyBird, which is a ClickHouse serverless solution for analytics products. And this is a case of analytics where I wouldn't know the analytics of my spending. So everything around the cost, the user, the label, the time, I'm just sending that data to TinyBird. The cost to run this should be pretty low for you because it's more of a backend tool. It's not being called thousands of times by your users. You're just storing the data here and then you're running queries every so often when you log into the dashboard. So here you can see some of the different calls I'm making. I have five different calls here, a cold email checks, choosing a rule for a user, how to respond to an email, arguments for this rule and so on. And you can see what's costing me the most money. How I work is first I'll choose a rule for the user that we have a lot less input. And then once I've chosen a rule for the user, what, what to automate, then we'll stop filling in all the data. So for example, if the rule is let's reply to the email on behalf of the user, that's the rule that's chosen. But then what's the content of the reply? So that will be a further task after that, if it's needed, if this task needs dynamic data. And the reason I split it up like that is because the AI actually perform better this way, but it can also lead to cost savings. But every time we had choose rule, we're actually calling args for all automatically, which is arguments for all. But in many cases, that wasn't needed. So I was burning through a lot of money and I got a surprise $100 bill for the day. Luckily, it didn't go higher because I had uh, a limit set in my account. But yeah, there are plenty of stories of people paying $5,000 costs to the LLM to open AI because costs just balloon. So yeah, definitely, by the way, if you're playing around with this stuff, put some sort of limit, you'll know what makes sense for you. But put a $100 limit, a $1,000 limit, whatever it is, just so that things don't go too crazy beyond your expectations. So open AI will stop charging you at a certain point and will also block your AI calls. Here you can see the total cost. This I'd also be able to get in the dashboard on OpenAI. You can see how much I'm spending on the different GPTs, depending on what a user's preferences are. Here you can see I'm spending a lot more on GPT-4, but also doing a lot more calls for GPT-4 right now. And here you can see how many calls I'm making per user. So here you can see this user's got 800 calls. I've hidden the ID of the user, but you can also add that in the query. And then also cost per user. So this user costs $6.40, which is quite expensive because it's only the last day or so. So you can see the, some of these users, this will be a few hundred dollars per month that they're going to cost me and I'm only charging them $20 per month. So all of that is great, but how can you actually use what I've done here. So let me show you how I actually went and built this. It's a pretty simple project. It's part of the Inbox Zero repository, but you'll see that I've got a package just for TinyBird AI analytics. So this can easily be extracted and used in other places. The first thing we do is define a schema of what we want the data to look like. So here you can see I'm storing the user ID, which might be an email or whatever user ID is in your database. I've got a timestamp. I've got the number of tokens that I use, both prompt tokens and completion tokens. This is input tokens and output tokens. I've got a cost. How much does this cost? Because GPT-4 is different to GPT-3.5 and other LLMs. I also store the model. So for example, it could be GPT-3.5 or 4. And then the provider. So this could be, let's say, OpenAI or Mistral or Facebook or whoever is behind it. And then I've also got two optional fields, which are label and data. I actually don't use at all right now, but I could theoretically pass in specific data for every single 
call, for example, what, what the query is that I'm making and for label. So this is categorizing it by the type of action. So before I mentioned choose rules or choose arguments for the rule. So that's what label is. So this is a data source to push this to tiny bird. You can follow the instructions in the readme, but in short, all you do is TB push data sources using their CLI and you'll have that data source stored by you in terms of the other packages we have. So I load up the tiny bird client here. I have the option to delete the data for a specific user. And the most important part is publishing the data, which is a Zod object just to make sure it's all in the correct format. And then I build an ingest endpoint that publishes the data to TinyBird and stores it. So it's very simple, everything I do here. And the main thing that I do in the app to use this is call publish AI call. Here you can see it's used in just one place. Every time we do an open AI API call, I store all the data for the user. And I also store some data for Redis. This is separately. This is actually what I use internally for the app. This is just for the analytics purposes, and I don't intend to use it to check user data, but I could at a future point if I so decide. But basically every time I've got some usage, I'm calculating the cost. We do that over here. So here you can see the different pricing for the different models. And of course this pricing changes over time. So if in the future GPT-4 Turbo goes down in price, I could adjust it and the new API calls would be at a lower price range. This is the price per 1000 tokens based on the open AI documentation. And the last part of that is where I call AI usage. So every time I call open AI, I'm doing this. I could maybe clean this up a little bit. Instead of calling it 10 different times in the app, I could also potentially create a wrapper around OpenAI and pass it in directly. That's probably what the SDKs do if you're using some other analytics platform, but th this was the easiest way for me to get this done quickly. And I don't need to over-architect it. Maybe I'll change how this code is written in the future, but it's pretty simple. And that's how you get these dashboards. You also be able to see charts in these dashboards and th there's no UI that you actually have to set up yourself. It's all just done automatically. Here you can see Augs for all is by far the most expensive choose rule after that. And then some of these are much lower costs. That's also because they're called a lot less often in the app. And of course you could also track usage over time and see charts like that. One last thing, there's something called pipes in TinyBird. So you have data sources and you have pipes. Data sources is basically a table of data. And that's what we saw before. This is our data source. And the other concept is pipes, which I don't have an example of, but for example, if I want to show you another pipe in the app, this is what it would look like. And it's basically a SQL query that gets the data back for us. So I could actually add these examples. This is a demo pipe that I manually put in into the dashboard here. I could decide also to put these into the pipes folder and then I would have it running in the repo as well. But since my app isn't using it, I didn't do that for now. If you're new to this channel, I'd love for you to subscribe. I hope you enjoyed the content. Also give my GitHub repo a star. It's called Inbox Zero. That's the example I use for a lot of this video. And yeah, until next time.